welcome everyone today and thanks for taking time out of your busy schedules and uh, uh, we've got a limited amount of time so we want to uh, make the most of it and so my presentation is going to be about uh, 45 minutes and hopefully give us you know, 10 or 15 minutes for some uh, some discussions and so um, as we get going through this if if there's things that you have questions about um, you know, please note them and make sure that we are able to address them uh, at some point. So, um, thank you again. And I've uh, been doing this for about 30 years. And, and so, um, <clears throat> just, just kind of a natural part of the whole process uh, in solar. And, and so, the construction process. Uh, and so, getting the smaller and smaller systems, residential size, we really need to have. Um, some good and some processes in place so that um, we can quickly view and, and process these projects. Um, as we get larger and larger projects, that that need for um, streaming becomes less. There's typically more uh, unique engineering involved and things like that. And so uh, this is going to be focusing on small systems, residential size which could also include uh, some small commercial that were would be installed on uh, buildings that were of similar construction to residential. So a lot of our, our small commercial uh, construction in the United States actually could be converted homes. And so uh, because of the way things have been annexed or uh, rezoned or things like that, uh, we, we have a lot of uh, small businesses that are actually in homes and so the structures are identical to residential construction in many ways. Uh, let's dive in. And, and uh, some of the, if you, if you were in the presentation back in the spring, um, I apologize for any um, uh, issue here, but sometimes that's helpful in the process. Uh, but these guidelines are for simple criteria for building electrical and fire codes. Uh, for compliance purposes, and uh, uh, let's see. Can you see audio? Because my audio thing came up on me. Uh, uh, Peter? Uh, hmm. Well, you are, okay. Can you guys hear uh, some audio stuff? Just came up on my screen. It looks like looks like um, hearable, but he can hear you. Great. It's, it's funny. On mute, so. Yeah. So when you're in a webinar, you you you, you uh, I was, had a situation where I got disconnected and talked for five minutes, and somebody had to call, call me back. Okay. Thanks so much, and uh, feel free to to stop me if there's something you'd like to talk about. Um, things that are of most importance. Uh, let's move on to the next slide here. Uh, so there's going to be there's an eligibility process for this simplified process. So the idea here is that we create a uh, a box, if you will, where uh, it fit inside this box, uh, which is a constrained box related to the codes. Um, <clears throat> then uh, you are classified as a simple system or a simple and, and eligible for a simplified process. If you're in the box, uh, um, then as a contractor or a homeowner that's wanting to do a system, they have the option of, of constraining system to the box or uh, going through the normal channels of uh, construction that every community has. So there's a structure review that basically shows that you're in the box uh, and the electric review um, and so it doesn't uh, in this particular version it doesn't get into details on systems for instance there's a lot of interest in battery systems but that's kind of an area uh, as far as codes and stand go and and so uh, we're not going to try to tackle that in this particular setup but there's definitely efforts underway to do that um, and so if we uh, the codes that address issues related to small residential size PV systems, 
Uh, we're looking at the National Electrical Code. <clears throat> we're looking at the uh, International Residential Code, the Building Code, Fire Code, and then ASCE 7, which deals with the structural uh, aspects that the building relates to. Uh, so if, uh, what is required for a permit, um, TIP jurisdiction has some process to apply a permit, which would have some requirements, just about information about the project, project scope, location, who's installing the equipment, things like that. Um, and then second, there's going to be uh, a need for information at the site, uh, showing location, major components, and things like that. One of the features of PV is that we are going to get fairly specific about where the, where the panels are going on the roof. Um, most of them's out there, especially in suburban environments and urban environments, are going to be located on rooftops. And so um, we don't know where they're going to go on the roof. So we can show compliance with requirements related to the roof. So, um, and also the equipment and things like, like that. Uh, electric sheets help us understand uh, what the electrical configuration is and the equipment being used. And typically, we're going to have specification sheets and information sheets about the equipment, which would include the P modules, uh, converters, if there are converters, inverters, and, uh, and importantly, nowadays, our mounting systems. And so the mounting systems have gotten a lot of attention as of late. And uh, there's some new standards that we're going to talk about uh, that help us with the mounting system part of the process. Installed, um, oh, well, I guess let's, let's talk about simple permitting for a sec. Um, so, and kind of going back to the high level, why this is needed um, to have a simplified process to evaluate these things in, in a fairly structured and abbreviated manner, um, and then uh, eliminate need for detailed engineering for projects that meet that fit into the box. Um, and so intended to circumvent the engineering process, basically the box is credited on the engineering principles that are in the codes. And um, basically we're showing that we're clearly compliant with the electrical and building codes and the fire code as well. So uh, that's really the basic intention of that process. Once installed, then we get into the inspection process. And so <clears throat> having an, a concise inspection checklist, and we're not getting into detailed information about doing inspections today, but um, we'll be providing some, some basic one-page inspection checklists that uh, have been used for uh, lots of residential projects that can help the field inspector um, with the limited time they have in the field to look at the things that are of most importance uh, to the safety of the project and making sure that it's compliant with the code from an from an inflation point of view. Um, when inspections also every community has their way of doing things. Uh, we have a lot of communities where if you call the day before uh, you can get an inspection the following day. That may not be possible in certain communities and so then the question is it's really about having a defined time frame where an inspection can be um, made, and that is challenging. And so um, to the extent that those things can be uh, understood uh, down, if, it, if we can get down to a, even a two-hour time, time frame, that's, that's pretty ideal. A lot of communities might be able to give a morning or afternoon time frame. And uh, there's a lot of technology starting to go into this, and so um, only with iPhones and iPads and GPS and everything like that. Uh, we're we're moving towards situations in the future, and some communities have already implementing it, where um, we know exactly where the inspector is their day and their process, and so we can plan effectively around that, given uh, the concerns that they have and the issues they may have, and getting aid at one project or picking up uh, some time. Uh, maybe, maybe a project uh, doesn't have, to, they're not ready for an inspection, and so they move on to the next one. So lots of interesting things happen in the field inspection world, and uh, a lot of communities are working hard to develop the most efficient processes in that area. 
here. So um, we get this box that we're talking about. There's some basic, really high level things of no than 15 kilowatts, and I like to put in weird numbers like 15.36. Um, and it has to do with the largest system you could put on an 80 amp circuit breaker, which would be the largest system you could install on the load side of a 400 amp panel. Now, how many residential uh, services have 400 amp panels? Not that many. Uh, that would be an absolute max maximum. Um, simple installation for a very large uh, home. However, what's much more common might be uh, 200 amp services or 100 amp services. And in, the, in those cases on the load side, uh, typically we're looking about a seven and a half kilowatt system, about half that. Um, so for a simple system, again, uh, no larger than eight, in 15 kilowatts, there's different types of systems out there in the market, string inverter systems, microinverter systems, DC converter systems. These are all different options, and we have different electrical worksheets for those types of systems. Um, and so this uh, group of slides is really going to get into the details of the structural review of the process. Uh, structural review has certainly been an area that we've spent a lot of time on in the last several years to refine this and come with national guidelines that work anywhere. Um, and uh, indeed, uh, Minnesota is an area and the um, Great Plains areas uh, where uh, we have relatively high snow loads. Wind loads are not as high as they are, say, on the eastern seaboard, uh, but uh, snow loads are certainly much more significant and uh, these guidelines are designed to address uh, snow loads up to a pretty high level. Nitty gritty of some of this and I'm going to move through this fairly quickly just to give you a quick high level overview of what's in these uh, structural guidelines. <coughs> We've uh, divided these guidelines into member attached and sheathing attached systems. Uh, member attached systems would be systems where the anchors are connected directly to the rafters or trusses of the building, which has historically been the most common method. There are probably upwards of a million systems installed in that fashion in the United States. Uh, sheath hatch systems are less common, but becoming more common uh, a lot of, for a lot of reasons. One of the reasons is they are simpler to install. I don't have high a level of experience. Uh, experience with uh, hitting the center of rafters and things like that, which can be challenging. And so uh, these seating attached systems are coming along. They are uh, not strong as a member attached system, and so there are limitations related to where we can use these systems. Those limitations tend to be more related to high wind speeds rather than high snow loads. And um, there are obviously snow and wind issues involved, but let's talk about wind exposure and wind design, uh, design wind speed. And this is all on ASCE 7-10, which is what uh, uh, the recent building codes are based upon. Um, there is a new version of ASCE 7 that will be applied to the 2018 code, uh, and there are some few differences in that related to PV systems. But uh, if we look at uh, mesh systems, we're able to handle um, Exposure, wind exposure areas of B or C, which are uh, the most men wind exposure areas, uh, and design wind speeds not to exceed 150 miles per hour. Uh, there's nowhere in Minnesota or the Great Plains that I'm aware of that exceeds 150 miles per hour. So um, I think we're good. She attached systems, we're going to talk about specifics wind exposure and wind speed limits. Um, there are 120 mile per hour wind wind limits, there's 150 or 140 mile per hour wind limits, and so uh, we can go up to fairly high wind speeds even with uh, attached. Uh, structural uh, requirements do not cover uh, exposure D. Wind exposure 200 yards of a uh, body of water wider than a mile. Now obviously Minnesota is known for the lakes that it has. Um, however, um, there are a tremendous number of those lakes that are larger than a mile across, but there are certainly plenty of them out there. And if you had waterfront property, 
properties on those uh, larger lakes, then you could be wind exposure D. Uh, these guidelines would not cover that. There's kind of special uh, rules related to that, and we would need to do uh, probably some engineering related to that. Uh, it wouldn't fit in the box. It's a hill with a grade steeper than five, uh, five feet. And um, uh, so certainly that could be a possibility in Minnesota, not known for its, uh, its mountains, but there. And uh, so if, uh, if you were happen to be on an exposed hill, that, that could also create some issues. And so we're, we're constrained what the engineering uh, that's been done in this, uh, what it applies to. And this is of the most importance to uh, the 60 pounds per square foot snow load. Uh, done some training uh, earlier this year up in Duluth and all. Uh, apparently, there is a small portion of the very northern part of Minnesota that has a 70 pounds per square foot or 65 pounds per square foot uh, load area, and so this would, would that would be right on the right edge of of, of uh, this particular process uh, since it's designed for 60 pounds per square foot. However, uh, the vast majority of the folks. Uh, in Minnesota and the Great Plains would be under that, that 60 pounds per square foot. Uh, the weight of the array is less than four pounds per square foot. That's uh, within uh, well above the, the typical uh, weight of a PV array, which is typically around two and a half pounds per square foot. Uh, section is dealing with the existing roof uh, there, and the first requirement is that the array on a permitted one and two family roof structure or similar structure. Now, um, permitted roof structures or permitted buildings may, may only be, uh, have been enforcing the building code uh, maybe 30, 40, 50 years. Depends on the community, depends on the area. And so if it's in an area where there are no records on the uh, structural elements of the, of the home in that area, then we'd have to go look at the residential code and tape to see if the construction is consistent with what is considered standard construction today. Uh, done this uh, webinar, we just did this webinar yesterday, and one of the questions was related to that. Older homes have um, raft spacings and spans that are very different the IRC is today. Um, and uh, in fact, talking about buildings made out of, with the roof structure made out of oak, and so there's no oak in the IRC, and um, it turns out obviously that's going to be a far stronger structure than anything that would be shown in the IRC. And so then a community could make a decision that uh, older homes where there's no structural sagging or damage um, uh, may may get a pass on that just because the fact their existence for so long without any damage. Uh, is a pretty good testimony that they're good construction. Um, this one there is that with uh, wood rafters or trusses uh, with no greater than a 48 inch on center um, distance, and so that would be kind of uncommon to have uh, anything greater than 48 inches, and probably 16 to 24 inches is is more common um, in uh, in Minnesota. Uh, roof framing members are running up and down. Uh, up down slope uh, standard construction. That's what we're saying here. Sorry. Okay. On uh, three, I mentioned just just mentioned this that the uh, structure appears structurally sound without signs of alterations or structural deterioration. De example of deterioration might be uh, water you know, leakage from a leaky roof that caused damage to the structure that has not been repaired. Um, uh, sagging could be overdressing of the structure, uh, things like that. And so uh, there is evidence of those, those types of things, then that would be of concern, and that would need to be rectified prior to doing any, any, anything like this where we would fall on a roof. The sheet of the roof, uh, minimum of 7 sixteenths or thicker by wood or oriented strand board. Um, that's a minimum requirement in the building code now. Um, it's doubtful that anything you're going to see out there is going to be thinner than that. Um, in talking to some of the folks yesterday on the line, uh, obviously older homes are not going to have plywood. 
uh, or, or certainly or, or in a strand board, and so uh, maybe planking and things like that, and and certainly planking, um, you know, one by one and things like that can be significant, you know, of significant strength for these type of locations. Um, oops. Uh, uh, we like to see a single layer of, of uh, shingles, um, so not a re-roof layer of shingles over top. Um, and so if we have a re-roof layer, a uh, second layer of shingles on it, then we want to show that uh, the span tables in the IRC are able to handle that extra weight um, into the PV system. Uh, we know that it generally allows two layers of shingles um, and we want to make sure that, that everything all together works. Uh, X is the mean roof height is no greater than 40 feet above the ground for mesh or 30 feet above the ground for sheathing attached. And uh, those are very tall uh, mean roof heights uh, about buildings that are 45 feet above, you know, to the peak or 35 feet for sheathing. And so that's, those would be extremely tall houses, not to say that you couldn't have a house as tall, taller than that, but locations that, that would cover the vast majority of homes that are out there. And then lastly, if the seismic activities, some limitations on the roof, total roof area for those. those. Okay, the section is dealing with the mounting equipment. Um, the Again, as I said before, the mounting equipment has become a pretty important part of the process, and so um, manufacture the mounting equipment, the the uh, model number and everything is important because that has to do with uh, the plating, how it's uh, coupled with the PV modules, uh, the and we'll see when we get to the electrical section, ground bonding of the um, so this new uh, new L standard 2703 covers uh, fire ratings, grounding bonding, and structural issues, and so we're looking for ratings uh, 2703 ratings on that equipment. Um, that make, it makes it simple for the process and uh, makes it easy on the installer to comply with the requirements of the building and electric code. Uh, yeah, how, how the anchors are uh, seated to the roof, whether it's flashing or some uh, roof, roofing compatible uh, uh, sealant. A couple of slides are dealing with the specifics of member attached systems, and then we'll talk about sheathing attached systems. And I'm going to run through this fairly quickly. You'll have these uh, that you go back to and the checklist that these come from. As you can see, these are check boxes along here. And so we're looking to check off each one of these items. And then if we have slanted boxes, then we would need to check off at least one of the slanted boxes that, that applies. Um, so the reset back from the all roof edges by at least twice the gap under the modules. For member attached, uh, typical gap might be five inches, so you're probably you're talking about a minimum uh, to the side of the roof of about 10 inches. Um, this um, precludes things like modules hanging over the side of the building or over the peak of the ridge or anything like that. That's not allowed in this process. doesn't mean it couldn't be engineered to work. But there's aesthetic reasons why we don't want to see that, and um, so you have uh, communities where we we come up with codes of covenants and restrictions on PV systems, and they want to make the systems look good. And I, I strongly support that. Uh, as it turns out, from a structural point of view, keeping the a parallel to the roof and within the plane of the roof, in fact, in fact, uh, picture framed, if you will, uh, within that roof area. Um, makes it better as well as deals with some structural issues that we have to attend to in the building code. And cantilever over perimeter anchors more than 19 inches. This has to do with the 60 pounds per square foot um, constraint. And so we made that the constraint and allowed us to get up to that 60 pounds per square foot. Uh, under the module is no greater than 10 inches. That's really a wind loading issue. And then gap between modules either quarter on both sides or zero and a half inch. And this is also related to wind loading concerns. Um, um, it's going to have some information about low snow load areas. And so we're going to 
Uh, just pretend those don't exist because that does apply to the green areas. So uh, typical snow loads are well above 10 pounds per square foot. And so we're going to run our mounting rails perpendicular to the rafters. Uh, and uh, that'll just be the way to do it. We're not worried about any other method. Then when we get to the spacing of the um, of the anchors, then we're not going to exceed four feet, and the anchors and adjacent rows are going to be staggered. Um, uh, the trusses are no more than 24 inches on center. And so see some examples of that. The next two don't apply because they're related to lower snow load areas. Um, Upslope spacing is really based on the module manufacturer's instructions, and so we're going to follow those rules uh, for how far the rails are apart uh, um, up down the roof. And then uh, anchor fasteners, typically we're going to use 5 16th anchors with a 2.5 inch embedment. That's these lag screws are typically 3.5 to 4 inches long in order to get through the roof materials and, uh, and kind of uh, fasteners and things like that to get down to the roofing member. Um, and then there, there could be a manufacturer supplied process that's engineered that's of similar strength to that, 516s. The next we're talking about sheathing attached systems, just to give you an example of how that's addressed. Again, the same issues with around the perimeter of the roof uh, being twice gap underneath the modules. Um, again, camber no more than 19 inches over the edge of the perimeter anchors. And gap on modules is constrained to 5 inches rather than 10 inches. That reduces the wind loading. And the gap between the modules is set at at least uh, uh, 3 quarters of an inch, which also uh, applies for lesser wind loading issues. There's also a stipulation that this is for sloped roofs, which are of, of, of uh, 212 or greater. Um, roof pitch rather than um, sloped roofs of less than 2 and 12. This is a slide. You can come back and look at it, but this gets into the type of wood that's being used, and, and the upshot of it is if we've got dry wood rafters uh, or manufactured wood trusses, we're good to go. If we've got wet rafters, then we got to look at it in more detail. Uh, and this is due to some recent research on uh, the draw strength of roofing uh, of uh, sheathing in wet rafters. Uh, that thing that's being looked at by the whole building code, not related to PV as much as it is just sheathing a building. The next slide is dealing with um, restrictions on the location of anchors. And if we have, if we need a lot of uplift strength, then we're going to constrain anchors to what we call bones of strength, which is the middle 16 inches in uh, the uh, sheathing material. Um, and we won't into a lot of detail because we just don't have time to go into it, but there's some good research related to the withdrawal strength. Uh, center, essentially, of a sheet of uh, paneling, uh, roof sheathing, other uh, than the edges. And so uh, you can get twice the strength, the pull-out strength in the center as you do on the edges. Uh, so we'll see some examples of that. But uh, is if we don't, don't uh, if we're attention to where we're attaching the anchors in a sheathing attached system, um, then we have to be in wind zone one, which is three feet from the edge of uh, any roof edge. So be in the middle, the roof with a um, of a three three foot um, pick frame around that, around the system of the roofing area of about three, three anchor uh, down about half a module. So basically two anchors per module. Often we might have three or four anchors per module in the types of sheathing systems. So that's not a very difficult thing to, to meet. And then we're all talking about wind exposure B, which is essentially a suburban environment. Uh, where most homes are located. Uh, wind exposure C would would really apply to a home that's in the middle of a field somewhere. So if it's off itself in the middle of a field and there's no trees around it that would shade the um, wind from the building, then we might be exposure B, and that would not apply to this 
a special case of anchors not in band of strength. Punction uh, to bands of strength, and we can go to much higher wind speeds, and we can go to exposure C at 120 miles per hour. And so that, that's what this is talking about, and we'll see some examples of that later uh, in the last few minutes of our presentation here. Um, this is getting into more details about bands of strength, and I just we don't have time to go into it. Uh, for those that are really interested, I'm I'm more than happy to talk to you offline about those things. Lots in this section. Um, and then also important is, is the anchor to sheathing connection, making sure it's capable of, uh, we don't want um, an anchor to be, uh, we certainly don't want to pull a sheathing off the roof, but we certainly, uh, but what's of importance is we don't want the anchor to pull out of the sheathing. And so we're going to require a minimum test related to this of 166 pounds of design capacity. And then the general state of this, that any of these structural items can't be checked off, then the building official may require the installer to, install to provide structural calcs uh, stamped and signed by a design professional addressing the unchecked item. And so it could be that we went through the whole thing, and the only thing that's not addressed is, uh, um, uh, is what items on the list, and then a structural engineer could look at that and provide a write up uh, as to how this is going to address that particular item. The table that we have in our, our uh, we have a 60-page commentary document, and all this is going to be posted in the next, so probably web on Solar ABC, uh, not on Solar ABCs, but on Soul Smart website. Um, Soul Smart is, is revamping their website, and the SoulSmart.org is going to be the new website, and this will be SoulSmart.org forward slash permit. Similarabcs.org forward slash permitting, which is where the older expedited permit process guidelines currently are housed. So this is a little summary table that's in that commentary, 60-page commentary, which gives a lot of detail about um, the, the details of the structural information. And the intention there is that uh, in your communities, uh, we may have some structural engineers on the call, but you may know. Uh, your structural engineers, if you're not one, and uh, they often have lots of questions, and they want to know that things are being done properly. And so we we have got a lot of trouble to provide a lot of information uh, for folks to help understand that due diligence has been performed in setting up these guidelines. Let's talk about the electrical side. It happens to be quite a bit simpler than the uh, um, structural side. It's been mined over many more years than the structural side has. And so uh, we have electrical components that are, are going to be certified and safety certified and listed to standards that are out there that have been out there for many years. Uh, we also have a mounting system, as I mentioned, the new UL2703 mounting uh, system requirements that, that cover grounding and bonding of the structure. It makes it a lot simpler to ground and bond it properly. And uh, constrain the PV array to no more than two series strings per inverter input, uh, and many inverters could have two, two to three inputs, and say no more than four series strings total per inverter. That's up to a pretty large system anyway, um, and our, our wire sizing and everything have been predicated on these items. Seeing this next little section. Um, basically just specifies that the wire size is going to be 10 gauge PV wire for exposed conductors and wire conduit are going to be 10 gauge THWN-2 or all these other types uh, of options. Um, information in here about meeting the requirements of rapid shutdown, which is a new requirement in the electrical code as of the 2014 code. And then item five is dealing with uh, making sure that the inverter capacity is compliant with the service disconnecting means and the service equipment, the site, if we're doing it on the load side of the connection, which is most through like a straker and a panel, then we need requirements of this table uh, that basically limits the size of the system based upon the size of the service and the service equipment. 
The other about uh, the electrical side of a PV system is has to do with voltage, uh, not, not uh, too much voltage to the input of inverters or converters and things like that. And voltage predicated on the design temperature. Um, and so in cold climates, such as Minnesota, uh, we're, we're very concerned about the voltage increase that occurs with photovoltaics. It's a natural part of the way it works. And so we provide information on um, temperature data that we would then use with the electrical code to determine uh, what is uh, the, the proper um, uh, characters for the high for for very temperatures, and so I show you here, uh, and it's maybe a little hard to see on the screen here. Maybe I can make it a little larger. Um, the um, the metropolis area, and I'll just click on the uh, St. Paul Minneapolis St. Paul Airport. Um, we see minus 28 degrees C. Now that doesn't mean that's Temperature based on data, statistics. Data, um, it's the average uh, minimum for all the years on record. So, if at all the years on record and looked at the the low uh, for each year, and then average those together, it's going to be minus 28 at the St. Paul Minneapolis St. Paul Airport. Now we go farther north, and you're going to see that the temperature down to minus 32, and we could go all the way up to International Falls. And uh, find very cold te temperatures up here. International Falls being the coldest in the lower contiguous uh, 48 states, minus 7 degrees C. Lovely there. I'm glad, but I'm sure it's wonderful. Um, okay, so let's move that out of the way. And so then we're going to use that data and we're going to look at the table in the National Electrical Code and it's going to give us a number like 1.22 or something like that. And we're going to multiply our rated voltage for that. And then we're going to use that for compliance with, uh, we had DC converters, making sure we're um, not over voltaging our microinverters or DC converters. And then also use that uh, for any inputs to a string inverter. If we have multiple modules in series, then we would do that calculation to make sure it's not going to create an over voltage situation. So this is because as we move around the country, um, the temperature issues uh, can be uh, quite a bit different. Uh, obviously, the, the climate in Minnesota is very different than the climate in Florida. And so we need to accommodate uh, those different climates in this national process. We have the standard electrical diagrams that we're going to talk about, and we'll show you some examples of that. And so five minutes we have left, I'm, I'm going to um, I'll just uh, skip through this stuff fairly quickly just so that you can get an idea of what's there. Um, and, um, here's one for, um, for a yeah, multiple input string inverter. Um, and uh, the notes page that goes along with that, which covers the information about the components and their ratings and things like, like that. Uh, so. Uh, that's for string inverters, and then microinverters uh, looks a lot different. Uh, in microinverters, the diagram is quite a bit different. It's actually quite a bit simpler. Uh, less equipment involved, typically. Uh, similar uh, no page, except that we're not going to have a DC uh, disconnect sign, which is going to be the one difference. Uh, but these signs are code required signs that we have on this, this little sheet here. Let's talk about a couple examples and then we'll open it up to questions. So uh, here's an example with 30 285-watt modules. Uh, these are fictitious companies. I just made them up. They don't make it in America anymore, so they're made somewhere in Asia. I don't know where. Um, we got 25-watt modules, uh, and a half kilowatt inverter, and this product, um, and it's a sheathing attached system. Uh, it's a low pitch roof, a 4 and 12 pitch, um, and it's, it was built in 1988, and it's only got a single layer of shingles on it, probably uh, shingled, reshingled fairly recently. Um, okay, so let's talk about uh, the compliance documentation 
and here is uh, the site plan. And you can see with the attached system, there's actually quite a bit more attachments than we'll see uh, when we get to a member attached system, and that's because uh, we're holding up the modules at the edges typically. Uh, there's no rails in between, so we're saving money on rails, uh, and we're also not having to pay attention um, too much. We're, we're certainly having to pay attention to the rafters. The rafters would uh, be these uh, 24 inch on center vertical lines you see here, um, and these horizontal lines are the sheathing lines. So we normally start with a full set of sheeting at the edge of the roof and work our way up, and then we might have a small uh, um, it has to be a partial sheeting. Uh, that also helps us understand where the bands of strength are. The bands of strength being the center 16 inches here. And we can see that actually this bottom row is in the bands of strength, and so is this row in the bands of strength. So this, this section of modules down here is being held uh, in a much stronger area of the, of the uh, sheeting, whereas on the edges, and so it's not going to have as much strength. However, because it's in the center of the roof and more than three feet from the edge, then uh, uh, of two different things, and this uh, will be fine, certainly in a 120 mile per hour wind regime um, with um, wind and beat. So there's about how it's attached and the right spacings, the sheeting sizes and thicknesses and stuff like that on that sheet. On this, we cover the electrical equipment which includes the inverter, the modules, uh, those types of things, how many modules are in series, um, what the wire of the system is, and that's all covered in here. And uh, um, this document will be supplied as a uh, interactive PDF. So people in information, if they don't have the ability to um, catch this, this is kind of a stock drawings so that people can fill the information and the boxes that apply and fill in the information about, about the equipment. Or it's also available in um, videos, so, so uh, a community or a contractor could take that information and then um, actually modify it uh, directly with, uh, with the software that it was designed in. Same for the uh, a note page where we have information on the module, the 285 watt module, the inverter, uh, and then the signs that are required and things like that here. This is showing minus 12 degrees C. Obviously, this particular example was designed for a different climate. We'd see something like minus 23 uh, if we were in uh, in Minneapolis area. Minus 20, I should say, sorry. Minus 20 in the Minneapolis area and colder if we were in higher. Um, Attitudes. All right, seven and a half kilowatt microinverter system. It's got the same number as a second example, same number of modules, but uh, 30 inverters instead of one inverter. And we're going to use a um, system that's attained to the rafters, a member attached system. Similar house and similar comp shingle roof in this example. So let's, in this case, we've got a hip roof. Here we, uh, what we were talking about earlier, which has to do with the staggering of, of your attachments. And so what this does is this makes all the rafters uh, that are underneath the modules get involved with holding the modules. So what this does is this spreads the load of the array completely evenly over the process. In fact, uh, it's it's a perfect even uh, um, of the roof from the standpoint of snow loading which is of a lot of importance in Minnesota. And so uh, we could put attachments on every single rafter, but they would not be any better from a loading point of view than this method, which is the steer method. So since every foot in a roof is a potential leakage point, we're trying to limit the number of attachments, uh, keep to a minimum, and spread out the load as evenly as possible, and this does both of those things. Here you can see on the west side, the east side, and the south side. We sometimes see modules on the north side these days because they're so inexpensive. Folks might think that's crazy, but we run the numbers on it, and we'll find that in many cases, uh, a very low pitch roof, like a 4 and 12 pitch, that can be an effective method. Your uh, electrical diagram for the microinverters. We've got 
two set 15 microinverters going into this system, and we have the information about the microinverters and and the in, um, and the modules and the like, and the information related to it. We don't have anything in the uh, DC disconnect side of things because there are no DC disconnects because the modules are plugged directly into uh, the. Uh, so okay, that's. Uh, I'll kind of leave it on this slide just because it's a little more interesting to look at, and I'll open it up for questions uh, for the last 10 or 12 minutes. Any questions there? Everybody, uh, you have been unmuted, so you should be good to go for questions. What problems you come up with, with systems that have already been installed? Talking about right after installation, like in a field inspection, or, or later on down the road? Well, what, what seems to be the biggest thing to be concerned about? Either way. Yeah, Obviously, that's, a, that's a great question. I think the biggest concern has always been related to the ex, exposed cabling. Those are systems, and um, we have sharp edges in various uh, metal pieces up on the roof and things like that. And so my biggest concern from a safety point of view has always been uh, making sure that the, the cabling and the wires are, are neatly um, held up underneath the modules. Um, but underneath the array, there might be a four or five inch gap underneath the array. And I like to see clear blue sky underneath the modules. I don't like to see wires hanging down. And particularly in a high snow environment like uh, Minnesota and the Great Plains, um, any cables that are hanging down are going to catch snipe and potentially get uh, torn loose over time. And so that, Do you would, that would be a good idea. Then? Yeah. Do you think installing wires in conduit would be a a good either um, stick or um, steel conduit? Yeah, I mean. Uh, I'd say the, the most, the, what I think is the most durable method are these little uh, stainless metal clips. And these little clips clip into the module frame and they provide for a place where we can snap the wires in very neatly. Uh, and that would probably be my first choice. Um, you can use uh, quality wire eyes, uh, for, for some little areas where we, can't, we may not be able to use those clips. And um, and there are some that might have a wire way installed with them, so that would accommodate, uh, you know, putting our wiring in inside um, the elements of the rails and things like that. Would they have to be installed? Would you have to use PV wiring if it's put inside conduit or a wire way? Uh, if it's inside of a raceway, like like EMT, for instance, um, that it does not. Have to be P wiring unless the wire, unless the system is above 600 volts. So our 600 volt wiring, um, this is, you know, THWN-2 or whatever, which is common, uh, commonly used for bringing the wires off of the roof from a junction box onto the roof. That would be 600 volt wiring and would be fine. Does not have to be PV wiring. But if the system were a thousand volt wiring, which is uh, our commercial systems, a thousand volt systems, uh, then it would have to be PV wiring because there's very little out there um, with that voltage rating. Is it the heat that's generated, or? Um, well, the voltage rating is is the issue with PV wiring. Um, a PV wire is an exterior cable similar to USC wire, um, and it does have a 90 degree C rating on it, uh, typically, and then it's rated for 2,000 volts. And so those in combination make it required for systems that are above 600 volts and can be used for 600 volts and below because of, of uh, other concerns like the 2014 code may suggest that we need P wiring for ungrounded systems. Yeah. And so if we classify a system as ungrounded, then PV wire would also be used. And so it's very commonly used and probably the most common exposed cable in PV. Hey, I 
more question and then I'll let somebody else. As far as leaks in the roof, how often do we have leaks in the roof? Leaky roofs are certainly um, I would say that um, they do happen for sure. Um, nice flashing products on the market and some very quality urethane caulks that we can use that preclude those kind of that kind of leakage. But with temperature variations you have in Minnesota, I think you're maybe going to be um, more you know, have a, maybe a, a greater tendency for um, things to open up where we might have. Uh, uh, screws going through the roof, and so even the code doesn't specifically require flashing of of uh, screws and things like that. Um, there are some really nice flashing products on the market um, that, that I think would probably work better in Minnesota um, than, than say caulking materials and things like that that might work out over time. Um, but uh, you know, I'd say. At least 50% of the callbacks for, for roof leaks on TV systems uh, have nothing to do with the TV system. Uh, people have a leaky roof, and uh, obviously the last person on the roof is going to get blamed for that regardless. And uh, so sometimes it could be related to the TV system, but often it's you know, something else on the roof uh, leaking and gets blamed on the TV. Okay. Sorry about that. All right, questions. Any other questions? Um, it's worth noting that any wire management that you do on that roof, they have these sunlight resistance. Other they'll just rot away in no time. And yep. Absolutely. And so uh, you, you want to look for e, uh, either nylon 6 or nylon 12 are the two substances that are the most durable. Um, on 12, when we're connecting to um, um, galvanized steel, actually, it turns out that uh, nylon 6 does not work well with galvanized steel, and so nylon 12 we use with galvanized steel, but nylon 6 works fine with the aluminum products that we have, and uh, there are quite a few products out there that are made with nylon 6. And it's also worth knowing that you're going to need service disconnects up on that roof. Is this down to me? Please lane, what you mean by that? I, I would not agree with that statement. So, um, what about a service disconnect? Uh, a service disconnect, a toggle switch so that the electrician can string off. Oh, um, yeah, the code does not have any specific requirements for a disconnect at the array. Um, if we have equipment on the up on the roof that has to be serviced, then that equipment, say if we had an inverter, um, then we would have to have disconnectings for that inverter. Um, but there is no code requirement for a disconnect off the roof, with the exception of rapid shutdown. So rapid shutdown, which was applied in the 2014 code, and I believe is, is Minnesota now in the 2014. I, I think if you're not on 2014, it's soon. Um, the 2014 code requires a shutoff with 10 feet of the array, and that's going to be an automatic shutoff that's applied typically at ground. So that's different than uh, a service shutoff. When we use the term service in the electric code, we've got to be careful because services only apply to utility companies. Um, a servicing disconnect, which I think is what you may, you may be thinking about, uh, to provide ease, ease of service of equipment. If there's equipment on the roof to be serviced, then uh, inverter, then we are going to have disconnects uh, near it. Uh, micro inverter, for instance, uh, which is of course going to be on the roof, does have plug connectors, and those plug connectors uh, can comply with the disconnect requirements. And so, products sure, on the market like the space, those are actually uh, the connectors are are listed with their device as this. Connect. Are, are you plugging the plug as the disconnect? Then? That's correct. So the end phase. 
for that particular back the end phase microinverter it is, is a disconnect. Yep. Yeah. The code allows this you know connectors to be used as disconnects as long as they've been listed for the application in that situation. We'll focus at our designated ending time. So uh, for those that have to drop off, I understand. Um, if there are a few other questions, Bill, can you stick yeah. around for a, a few extra minutes? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Great questions. I'm more than happy to discuss this in more detail. Very good. Any other questions? So, uh, I have a question. Uh, I just wanted to co confirm uh, what version of the code is Minnesota currently on? We are on 2012. 20, so, the 2011 electrical code is, 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 is what the state is on, and, and the state code, which might be the 2012. There's 2012 state code. Put your hand on. Um, and so, so very good. So that's that's uh, helpful, and and um, uh, new requirements coming in the 2014 related to rapid shutdown, which is what I was referring to. Bill, if you could hear that, but we're having folks say that it, that uh, we're under the 2017 code. 2017. Okay. Um, there's this is through NEMA. NEMA has their their C map. Uh, which they keep up to date, and um, they just updated uh, this month, in fact. And let's see what the map says. Their map says that you guys are on the 2017. That's correct. Well, there you go. If you're on the 2017 code, then the requirements for red shutdown are, are pretty clear. Uh, a lot of detail in there in 690.12 does include the requirement that um, there basically be an automatic disconnect uh, for the array uh, for the coming off the roof, um, and um, and that's going to be then uh, within foot of the array in the 2017 code, which is far more restrictive than the 2014 code. So um, to, to go back to the comment about having a servicing disconnect on the roof, uh, the reality is that often will be some type of a device on the roof and it um, in many cases can test from the roof if you wanted to use it for servicing purposes um, and its primary purpose is for a uh, reduced hazard for firefighters and and the, and the, and the like the questions Well, I wanted to let everyone know that, um, you know, from a technical assistance point of view, um, we're available, and there's uh, several of us that, that are involved with various aspects of permitting and installing PV systems um, in the uh, SoulSmart group, and so I'm happy to answer questions directly, and you can get a hold of me fairly easily, so uh, uh, certainly Peter can help you with that. And um, uh, questions come up and concerns come up, we want to be as responsive as we can to help you guys um, as you work on um, streaming your permitting processes. So thanks, everyone, for your time, and look forward to uh, talking with many of you over the next several months. Thank you, Bill. That was outstanding. Really appreciate it. Uh, great information. And uh, like Bill just said, if you need to get connected to Bill, uh, you can always do that through me, Peter Lindstrom, with the Clean Energy Resource Teams. And um, and also, just as uh, we started off this afternoon, Minnesota court folks, um, I encourage you to keep away on your action plans, specifically those, those items that have been highlighted in red. Uh, we, we did record the webinar today. So we'll be getting that link out to uh, the Minnesota Court 
uh, as it's available. And uh, thank you, everybody. Um, wonderful webinar, and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Peter. Okay. Bye. Bye.